The following is a production of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So in Fukushima 2011, we had the triple disaster it's called. First the earthquake, then the tsunami, and then the loss of power at Fukushima Daiichi, the nuclear power plant. And it's that loss of power that caused the overheating, which led to the explosions and the release of radioactivity into the ocean and on land. In the ocean, with the cooling water that was used, a lot of that drained right back into the ocean or came out through those broken down buildings. So we had kind of two release pathways, the atmospheric fallout and the direct discharge of water into the ocean. If we look at radioactivity from something like Fukushima and you want to know how much was released, we often use units of Becquerel. So Becquerel is a decay event per second. So something like Chernobyl, there would have been a hundred petabecquerels release. A petabecquerel is 10 to the 15 power becquerels. So that's a very large number for a small unit of radioactivity. Fukushima was probably about two or three times smaller than that, 20 to 30 of these petabecquerels for the isotope cesium-137. Less radiation in total was released, but more to the ocean because it's right sitting on the ocean. Well, there are many different behaviors for radionuclides in the environment. Things like cesium and strontium are soluble, so they mix with the ocean currents. Isotopes like plutonium or naturally occurring thorium attach to the particles and are found in the sediments. Some are taken up at higher levels in seafood or seaweed. Iodine is one that concentrates in seaweed. So they often have a very different fate depending upon their chemistry now, not their radioactive properties, but their chemical properties. Most of the radionuclides are now dissolved, they're in that water, they're soluble. A little bit gets taken up by the biota, by the fish, by the plankton, and some of that settles to the seafloor, but it's primarily a dissolved element. Well, what Japan has done, what all countries do, is they set a threshold above which you're not supposed to be eating these contaminated fish. And the Japanese threshold is quite low, it's about 100 becquerels per kilogram. And there are places, particularly near Fukushima, particularly the bottom dwelling fish, where the fish exceed that level. That means those fisheries are closed for commercial fishing. One exception are the bluefin tuna, the Pacific bluefin. They've actually measured a small amount, traces of the Fukushima cesium off San Diego after the first year. And as they swim, they lose about a percent or two of the cesium every day. It's a salt, it goes in and out of the fish the same way it goes in and out of us. So we're actually not concerned for fisheries on the U.S. West Coast or in Canada because of the loss of the ice top along the way and the water concentration is just so much lower here than they are off Japan, even at their height. Well, we live in we call a radioactive world because there are many radioactive compounds that occur naturally in the environment. If you think of the ocean, the most abundant radioactive compound is potassium-40. It occurs from the weathering of rocks. And if you think of the levels of potassium-40, they're often thousands of times higher, tens of thousands of times higher than the cesium that's left over, say, from the 1960s weapons testing. Well, Fukushima, we're not saying radioactivity isn't dangerous, but Fukushima itself, for people on land, is a big deal. It's dangerous in those areas where there are leaks. There are many, many people who can't move back to their homes because of radioactivity. But on the ocean itself, we can travel, we can swim, we can take ships. We just have to keep monitoring and studying the food web and the uptake of the isotopes into seafood and consuming too much of a contaminated fish is not a good thing. So we do have to watch that over the future. To learn more about Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, visit us on the web at www.whoi.edu.